Welcome to the Museum of the City of New York. My name is Kubi Ackerman, and I am the director of the Future City Lab here at the museum. Uh, and we are excited tonight to present you with the second event in our new series, New York's Future in a Changing Climate, which explores the challenges and opportunities that are presented in the Future City Lab, which is the third uh, interactive and participatory gallery that's part of New York at its core, which is an exhibition which opened just over a year ago uh, and explores 400 years of New York City's past, present, and future. Um, this series uh, is presented in memory of Hilary Ballin, who was the uh, curator of the Future City Lab, as well as several other of the museum's um, most significant exhibitions over the past decade, including uh, The Greatest Grid and Robert Moses in the Modern City, and uh, Ballin, who was a professor of urban studies and architecture at NYU, as well as the vice provost of NYU Abu Dhabi, uh, passed away in June of this year, and she is sorely missed by me and all of her colleagues at the museum. Uh, part of her vision for the Future City Lab uh, involved expanding the role of the gallery <clears throat> by having it serve as a jumping off point and inspiration uh, for uh, for a variety of events such as this one in which we uh, which allow us to explore the big challenges that are covered in the gallery in uh, in greater depth and uh, for a wider public so we're very gratified to be able to present this program and all the events in this series in her honor uh, I'd also like to take a moment to thank our series sponsor Savile Studley who's made all of the programs in this series possible uh, we very much appreciate their support for New York City in a changing climate uh, I'd also like to let you know that all the series in this uh, uh, in the program, including this one, I'm sorry, this program and all the, all the events in the series are being recorded and will be air on public access television on MNN, the Manhattan Neighborhood Network, and this one will be shown on uh, eight, at 8 p.m. on December 20th on MNN1 and MNN5. For tonight's uh, edition of the series, Greening the Grid, New York's Energy Future, we welcome five distinguished speakers to uh, we'll discuss how we can transform our energy infrastructure to decrease uh, greenhouse gas emissions, among other goals. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, how the mechanisms by which such a transformation could take place, what it might look like, uh, but most importantly, what uh, New York City uh, communities and what we can do as individuals collectively, how we can participate in that transformation. This is a, a challenging topic in which one can quickly get lost in the, in the weeds of uh, arcane policy talk. Uh, however, uh, I would argue that, that there are few systems that have as far-reaching consequences for climate change and by implication for the future shape of our city as our energy infrastructure. Um, so we're very lucky to have with us here tonight some of, uh, some of the most qualified people in the city to help us uh, discuss this important issue. Uh, the conversation will be moderated by Michael Shank, uh, Head of Communications for the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance and the Urban Sustainability D Directors Network. And he'll be joined by our other panelists, uh, Charles Allison, Associate Professor of Professional Practice at the New School, Tria Case, University Director of Sustainability at CUNY, Bomi Jung, Vice President of Energy and Sustainability at the New York City Housing Authority, and Nilda Mesa of the Urban Design Lab at the Earth Institute at Columbia. Uh, so we're going to welcome uh, Charles, Tria, Bomi, Nilda, and Michael in just a moment uh, to begin the conversation. But I would like to say that following the discussion, uh, we invite you to head upstairs to the first floor of the museum uh, where you can explore the Future City Lab, which will be open until 8.30 this evening. So for those of you who haven't seen it, and for those of you who have, um, I strongly encourage you to go up there and check it out. There's a number of maps as well as a huge amount of data and information on the impacts of climate change on New York City among other uh, challenges and you also have the opportunity there to design a waterfront park in a site in New York City uh, among other design challenges which is very engaging and a lot of fun so uh, I do hope you'll uh, you'll avail yourselves of that opportunity uh, before we get started I also want to start a th uh, thank our uh, series partners climate nexus and the new school uh, so these two organizations have been instrumental in helping us uh, develop this series and in helping us finalize the program, as well as in helping to spread the word. Uh, and, and I'd also like to thank our robust group of series affiliates, uh, which is a, 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 a long and growing list, um, th who have also been helping us to promote this event. You can find the full list on your program, as well as on our webpage. And if you are, your organization are interested in becoming a series affiliate, please let us know. 
Uh, thank you all for your support. Uh, we would also like to invite you to join us for the next event in this series, which is called Liquid Assets, New York's Watersheds and Waterways, where another distinguished panel will dive deep into New York City's complex water systems, uh, figuratively, that is, uh, to discuss what New York can do to protect its drinking water supply and its recreational waters um, in the coming decades and how they might be impacted by climate change and what the larger implications are for the regional environment and economy. That event will take place on Thursday, February 22nd at 6.30 here in the museum. Uh, and you can register online at mcny.org forward slash future. So I very much hope to see you there. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to ask you to please silence anything that buzzes or beeps or rings. Uh, but you can keep your phones on if you'd like to tweet during the event uh, using the hashtag MCNY Live. Uh, so with that, I would like to welcome our panelists to the stage. Great, welcome. Who was here for the last talk about rising waters, moderated by Andy Revkin, with a great panel about psychology and art and fiction and death? So a few of you, okay. I just wanted to see how much we want to complement that conversation with this conversation. My name is Michael Schenk. I spend my days working with cities all around the world, helping them hopefully communicate more effectively about the work they're doing. My job as a moderator of this conversation is to make sure we have, in an hour, enumerated enough takeaways in terms of what can we do. Some of you are, I'm sure, heavily engaged on greening the grid already. For those of you who aren't and are new to the conversation or want to get more involved, hopefully we can, in conversation with you, enumerate further ways to help green the grid in New York City. When I'm coaching my mayors and sustainability staff as part of the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance and the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, CNCA, the former is or represents the highest ambition cities around the world who have the great goals of 100% renewable energy or 80% greenhouse gas emission reduction by 2050, which is a New York City goal. They often, understandably, as politicos, want to present a polished product to the public or to the press after the fact, here's what we did. And in fact, I've encouraged them to turn over the problem to the community as a whole. How do we fix this together? Because too often I find there's sometimes an antagonistic relationship between voters and constituents and those that are representing those voters and constituents. And there's an expectation of, what have you done for me lately? Or New York City, how are you gonna fix this problem? Or you fill in the blank on the city and there's an expectation that the city is gonna green the way forward irrespective of community input. Clearly, community involvement is essential and civic engagement is essential. So I'm keen to have this conversation be a shared problem-solving conversation of how do we tackle New York City's biggest challenges? When I first moved to New York City, one of the mini-series I saw, who's seen Rick Burns' PBS? It's an eight-part series on New York City. A couple of people. So I stopped watching it about halfway through because I was tired of the following. Never before had a city so great as New York tackled such a problem like this. All throughout the series, there's never before had a city ever done this. The greatest city in the world. There is that expectation now on the grid front that New York City will lead the way. And if you talk to anyone in the city, and Nilda and actually the whole panel, because they've worked with the city, will recognize that we have some pretty serious challenges. And buildings are one of them, transportation another, waste another. And so it is incumbent upon all of us to engage that effort, not just simply an expectation that city X, Y, or Z, what have you done for me lately and how are you gonna solve these climate change problems, but how do we work on it together? I am thrilled with this panel because they represent experience and expertise in every single sector that's gonna be critical to greening the grid from finance and private sector, which Charles brings to the table, to city experience, well they all have some city and state experience or working with city and state officials, to community engagement and a lot of community mobilization and thinking about affordable housing for people in poor communities in New York City, to previous sustainability directors to my left who worked for the city. So we've got finance, private sector, we've got state, city, 
local community engagement here, incredible expertise. This is a panel of practitioners, and so I'm thrilled that they're here to talk with you together about what we can do collectively, problem solving this collectively to green the grid. So this is how it's gonna run. The panelists will spend a couple minutes kind of clicking through some images and framing their conversation and their work for you. And then I'll get into a Q&A with them for maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then we'll get into a Q&A for 20, 25 minutes with all of you. So begin preparing your questions because I'll definitely want to make sure we have plenty of time for that. So we're gonna start with the panelists presenting from Charles down to Nilda. Charles, the floor is yours. Well, this is really a very special opportunity and I'm so happy to be here. Uh, one thing I thought was interesting uh, when um, the, the folks here said, well, you don't actually have to give a presentation. If you could just send us one slide, that would be really great. And I thought, wow, you know, I, I teach, I'm a faculty member at the new school, one slide. I don't think I understand how to do one slide. Uh, one PowerPoint slide. So, of course, I had to squeeze four images and four different ideas or approaches on, on my one slide. And I originally had 20 photos that I was picking from. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL. It's one of the 13 uh, federally funded laboratories in the United States. It's a, a Department of Energy uh, organization that is subcontracted out to uh, a private company called Battelle. And what they do, and they've been around for about 40 years, I think, and what they do is just live and breathe and dream, how can we uh, And it's all about science. It's all about the science. And the science doesn't have any politics attached to it. Um, thank goodness. Um, but what, what they do is, uh, for example, for electricity in the grid, I mean, the grid's really critical. Electricity is critical. Electricity usage is up. Um, and in urban areas, it's especially problematic uh, because, um, well, these four issues. Um, so one thing that uh, I, I thought is my biggest sort of um, issue around the grid is about security, you know, cybersecurity and, and that sort of thing. So being secure and resilient is really important and the folks at NREL are spending a lot of time on how to make the grid more protected because uh, uh, basically electricity sources in the United States are, are rife open to um, interference from the outside uh, in an almost terrorism type way. Um, also microgrids, the whole idea of the, I don't know when the last electricity plant was built, uh, 40 years ago? I mean, you just don't build large electricity plants anymore because no one wants one anywhere near them, number one. And number two, the costs are really high. But the idea is take the assets you have and um, distribute the energy a little bit better. Microgrids are important. Uh, power system operations, certainly people are trying to make the operations of power plants more efficient uh, and more understandable. Uh, peak average usage and, and how do you shave power usage over different times. I mean, you never really have enough electricity at the times you really need it. Um, if anyone here travels anywhere else in the world, there are plenty of places where you go where brownouts and blackouts happen every single day. People have to plan their businesses around, well, we're not going to have any power this afternoon for four hours. So what do you do? So we're actually quite fortunate here, even notwithstanding the problems. And then and sort of integrated devices on both sides of the grid. The grid right now, for the most part, is an analog grid. Um, it's not really smart. So this whole idea of smart grid, how can you use technology to um, better manage and maintain power, uh, better uh, share power, and better understand how much power do we use? So these are kind of like four of the 20 topics I'd be happy to give you slides on, but uh, there you go, how's that? Okay, um, so for those of you that, that don't know CUNY, we're 30 million square feet and about half a million people coming through our campuses at any given year. So we have our own uh, very large footprint ourselves. Um, and one of the areas that we have been working on for over a decade is, is to really think about um, how do we, you know, how do we support renewables and sustainability across the city um, using you know, a public university that um, has a responsibility to the city. And so we've been uh, partnered with 
the mayor's office of sustainability, um, and with the New York City Economic Development Corporation, uh, now for over a decade, in something called the New York City Solar Partnership. And that, that partnership has really been looking at how, how do we integrate uh, green into the grid? How do we integrate renewables? And in, with a particular focus on solar, in part because when we started to look at solar in New York City, we, th we saw that it was happening in New Jersey, it was happening in Massachusetts, it was happening elsewhere, uh, but it wasn't happening here. And so we actually worked with the National Renewable Energy Lab. Um, we, didn't, we didn't talk about this ahead of time. Um, and in fact, uh, took a look at uh, what is the impact of solar on the grid? Um, are you all familiar with New York City having a network grid? Is that? Okay, so yeah, so, so New York City has a very particular grid, and so um, in the way that our grid was, was built, we have to think uh, very hard about, and Con Ed has to pay close attention to, how uh, distributed generation is uh, deployed on, on this network grid, and that's one of the things that um, you were sort of getting at in terms of the smart grid. So uh, we've been really looking closely at that. And uh, how many of you have seen the uh, NY Solar Map, the New York Solar Map, nysolarmap.com? Great, okay, so for those what's of you. The, what's the address, maybe? nysolarmap.com. Yeah, um, <laughs> so um, if you go onto that website, you can plug in your address, any address ac across the state of New York. Uh, but in New York City, we actually have a, a 3D map, in essence, of New York City. So it will take into considera consideration shading. So if there's a building next to you or trees, it will tell you what's the solar potential for your rooftop, and there's a calculator, and it will tell you what that investment would look like, <coughs> and it will also link you to solar installers. So you can, get, um, you can get some bids from solar installers, and there's statistics on the site, so you can see what are your neighbors paying for solar? What is the average price of solar in, in your area, in, in your borough? What does growth look like for solar in your borough? So you can really get that information, and it's been very important to us as Sustainable CUNY to get that information out to you so that you can make decisions. And, and we'll talk hopefully a little bit later about things like Solarize and Community Shared Solar, which are programs that you can uh, participate in that will help you either um, buy down the cost of solar on your rooftop or uh, participate in a solar installation if you can't uh, put it on your own rooftop. One of the things we realized after Hurricane Sandy was that we were seeing this great growth in solar, but when the blackout hit, everything had to shut down. When the grid goes down, your solar goes down, unless you've designed it in a way that it has a black start inverter. It can start up without the grid being on. Now, when that happened, we realized we had to think about resiliency and how can solar or renewable energy support resiliency. And so we created the Smart DG Hub. And what the hub is doing is bringing experts from around the country, from around the world, to look at what are the policies and the technology and what's the financing scenario that we need in order to make renewable generation also resilient. And we're working very closely with the state of New York and with the city of New York to talk about how do we deploy this technology into our marketplace. You can't just take a battery and put it in, into a building. You have to get it permitted. We have to understand how do we make sure that it is done in the right way as well. So working very closely with the utility, with the fire department, with the buildings department, uh, we're looking at how do we make transparent now, not just how do you put solar on your rooftop, but how do you make it resilient and how do you pair that with something like storage? Okay, so um, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm the Vice President for Energy and Sustainability at the New York City Housing Authority. The Housing Authority is the largest residential landlord in New York City, and in fact, it's the largest residential landlord in North America. So, um, you know, what that comes along with is not only do we serve about 400,000 residents in the buildings that we directly own and, and manage, um, but we also run the largest housing voucher program in the country, so about another 200,000 people depend on NYCHA for uh, housing in, affordable housing in privately owned buildings. We are often the largest customer of X, right? So we use about 5% of the total, uh, we consume on NYCHA properties about 5% of all the water that's consumed in New York City. Um, we're the, you know, one of the largest consumers of gas, um, so one of Conrad's largest customers. So you know, a lot of the, um, the things that we talk about when we talk about NYCHA has to do with the 
the problem is hard because NYCHA is big. And um, one of the things that's really lovely about what I'm here to talk about today is that it is actually the, the, the scale that NYCHA has that's all allowed us to, uh, to be a player in the space around particularly solar. Um, most of the work that my department does is really focused on reducing our carbon footprint through reducing consumption of gas or consumption of energy. Um, but I'm here today as part of this panel because we also have an initiative that we're working on with CUNY and others um, where we are using NYCHA rooftops to host community shared solar installations. And so when I came to NYCHA about three and a half years ago, NYCHA had already made a commitment that we were going to roll out a solar program, but we didn't really, we, we didn't give it, give it any specifics, right? And so basically, um, you know, they came to, when I started at NYCHA, they came at, to, HUD came to us and said, well, you, you're supposed to be signed on for this renewables program. What is it that you're going to do? Like, what's the commitment that you're going to make? And yeah, we didn't know. Like, you know, we're landlords. We, that's, you know, solar is not really what we have expertise in. So we turned to CUNY and said, well, what should this number be? Um, and so CUNY used the solar map and um, came up with, you know, some numbers that they said were, they said, well, this number is impossible. <laughs> this number is low. And we, so the, the range of doable is in this range. And so we said, okay, we'll take the more aggressive one because why not? We're, we're the largest you know, landlord participating in this program. We should have an aggressive goal. So we put out a goal that we were gonna try to put 25 megawatts of renewable capacity on NYCHA properties. And then we started digging into, well, what does that actually mean for us? So NYCHA actually uses obviously a good a chunk of electricity, but because we are a public um, agency, we buy through um, the public, uh, utility, right? So this New York, New York um, uh, Power Authority. And because of that, we actually get a very good uh, rate on our electricity. And so it, it, when, we, when we started looking at the cost benefits of putting solar on NYCHA roofs for NYCHA's direct benefit, it turned out that it, that wasn't, those projects were not going to pencil out because we would actually have to buy electricity at a higher cost if we were buying the solar that's actually getting generated on our own rooftops. So. You know, that actually turned into an opportunity for us because um, one of the things that we learned by working with, you know, industry experts like CUNY is that, w that one of the barriers that community solar has faced in New York City is a lack of siting opportunities. So there are developers who want to develop community shared solar, but there's no place to put it because unlike in other places, um, there, we don't have open tracts of land where you can go and put in a nice solar farm. So, so that gave us the opportunity to say, okay, well, you know, NYCHA had, so we have this commitment that we're going to host solar. We can't buy the solar ourselves, and so it makes perfect sense that we would use this opportunity to help develop the community shared solar industry in New York City. I've said community solar like 10 times and didn't explain what it was. I don't know if you guys were all ignoring me and reading my slide instead. Um, but basically, um, the concept is that you have uh, a building owner, so let's say NYCHA, in, in that little, the top little, no, where's that? The little, little building square there that says host. So we make, um, our, let's say, our rooftop available for a developer who's not us, a third party developer, to come and put a solar installation on our roof. The developer then set, uh, basically sells subscriptions to that solar installation to people who are, that, who are using electricity. So for, it could be, for example, you know, NYCHA residents who get Section 8 ho housing vouchers and live in a privately owned building. They have their own Con Ed bill. They, don't, you know, they, they wouldn't be able to own solar in a normal circumstance because they're a renter, right? So you, you don't have your own roof to put it on. But that person could be a subscriber in this community solar, shared solar structure. That person would pay something into the, in, in to buy into the structure, and then Con Ed pays the, uh, pays, pays the subscriber back, essentially, on the credit on their electric bill. So the solar developer owns and operates the, the, the solar installation. Subscribers basically sort of buy into that uh, installation. The developer then puts the power into the grid, and Con Ed credits the subscriber with a credit. Can I ask you a question? So if anyone in this audience wants to participate in that, how do they do that? Where do they go? <laughs> well, so our first RFP for this project, this type of project is out. We, are, we have sites. Um, that are, we've aggregated enough rooftops that we think that we could get up to six megawatts of installation capacity there. Um, once those, those developers are selected, then they will go and market you know, to subscribers. So we're, we're just at the very beginning of that process. 
Um, hopefully, folks who are you know in the industry, solar industry, are putting together their applications to NYCHA you know as we speak. Um, there are a couple of other community shared solar installations that are coming online. Coned is doing a low income solar, a community shared solar project that's going to be launching very soon as well. I think there's one or two other smaller um, projects as well. Um, so we are here sort of as essentially a landlord and a public agency, right? Because the reason why we thought that this, I mean, aside from the fact that we had this commitment and we you know, obviously wanted to participate, the reason why we thought that this made sense for us was because of the fact that we had a role that we could play in you know, helping uh, a, you know, a, a developing market for community share solar. And the reason that was important to us was that our own residents, there's just, there's, where NYCHA is largely master meters, so most NYCHA residents pay their electric bill sort of wrapped up into their rent. But we do have several thousand households that are paying their own electric bill, and we wanted those folks to be able to participate and lower their electric bill, as well as you know, the folks in affordable housing um, generally to lower their electric bill. These are also local jobs, right? So whether you're talking about marketing to subscribers or installing solar panels, these are jobs that NYCHA residents and you know, folks who are in these low-income communities that we serve could go and you know, get on a path to a green career. Thank you, Bum. Uh, yeah. uh, hi, I'm Nelda Mesa. Uh, thank you very much to Museum of the City of New York and Kubi and the rest of the team here um, for putting this panel together. Um, I am now at Columbia University. I am an adjunct professor at the School of International Public Affairs. I'm also affiliated with the Urban Design Lab at the Earth Institute. But previously, I was director of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability under Mayor de Blasio. So um, while I was there, um, one of the things that we did was we came out with One NYC, uh, and we also did a whole lot of other data gathering under um, many different um, projects to figure out what was going on with greenhouse gas emissions in the city of New York and where were these emissions coming from so that then we could develop the strategy to um, most effectively reduce the emissions. So um, one of the points that I wanted to um, make was how important the data is. So much of it is available online. You can go to New York City's website. You can look for a lot of data on, for example, building energy performance for buildings that are over 50,000 square feet. You can look at you know, what the city's um, greenhouse gas emissions profile is uh, and so forth. Um, so some of the things that we found in doing it, I'm, I'm going to give you a bit of a, a, a sort of, I'm going to take a step back from um, some of the things that my esteemed colleagues here have been talking about. Um, so one of the things that we found was that New York City uh, has, first off, um, per capita, it's much lower on greenhouse gas emissions than the average for the U.S. It's something like one-third lower of the average of the U.S., which is great. Um, and you can, you can ascribe that to the city being as dense as it is, people living on top of each other, and people using public transportation as much as they do. Um, within that, about 70% or so, it changes a little bit from year to year, but you know it's been pretty consistent for the last 10 years at least, about 70% or so of uh, greenhouse gas emissions in New York City come from buildings and come from the energy that goes into buildings. About 20% comes from transportation, um, and about 7% or so is solid waste. So, you know, not so much with the solid waste. But compared to other cities, it tends to be, the average is more like 40%, 40%, you know, between buildings and transportation. So the reason I want to, this, to, this is like one of my absolute favorite slides, <laughs> because it, it's in a nutshell, it sort of captures, you know, what New York City's greenhouse gas emissions you know, are, where they're coming from, where the, what are the sources of energy, and also what's producing, you know, by sector, the emissions. This, this slide's a couple years old, but, the, you know, it's basically, it hasn't changed all that much. Um, so you can see on the left, natural gas is a big part of the energy that goes into the city. That's mostly, um, it's, it goes in for buildings. A lot of it is, um, uh, you know, for the heating and hot water and so forth, but a lot of it is also uh, for generating electricity. Um, you can see nuclear is a big part of that. That's going to go away in 2022. Nuclear is essentially zero emissions. Um, it's not clear yet how that will be replaced, but many, many people in the state and the city and so forth are working on it. Um, renewables, you can see that's a pretty skinny line. Um, it's less than 5% of the city's 
Electricity comes from renewables. Um, and it's difficult to fix that uh, in the short term because um, the renewable sources of energy in New York State, by and large, are upstate. There are initiatives to bring offshore wind. Um, they may have read about, you know, off of Long Island, there are a couple of different in, um, projects to do this. Uh, but those are, you know, a number of years away and they still have to go through the permitting and so forth. Onshore wind, which is mostly upstate, um, those are hitting all kinds of road bumps because um, of NIMBY, basically. Lots of people don't necessarily want to see them. Um, and there are also issues with transporting the energy that's generated upstate to downstate. The transmission lines are pretty much at capacity. New York City, you know, uses a lot of energy, and so it's a, it's a long way to, to travel. Coal also, mercifully, is very low for New York City. Um, and then petroleum, you can see mostly that goes towards um, transportation, some for oil, for uh, heating for residential buildings. The biggest change in the last um, 10 years or so um, on New York City's greenhouse gas emissions, and they've decreased, I believe it's something like 15% at this point since 2005, which is pretty good. But the biggest factor for that is switching from coal to natural gas. Um, and beyond that, um, what we're looking at ahead of us is a much tougher kind of set of <laughs> circumstances in order to pull this stuff off. Um, and there are uh, several initiatives now, um, both from the, out of the mayor's office, but also city council on um, reforming the energy code and redoing um, building energy footprints. I would encourage you to take a look at those. Those are still very much kind of in flux in a way, um, but their um, energy efficiency is in some ways, the greenest way to go, the greenest electron is the one that's never used. And so, you know, so there's, there's a lot of opportunity there um, that can be, you know, sort of taken advantage of uh, in the shorter term. But um, outside of that, other trends are things like, you know, I, I would expect to see more electric vehicles um, in the years to come. The city made a big commitment to um, basically switch most of its fleet over to EV in order to help spur that. Um, and I would also say that another big trend is the, the power of the market. And so the demand that's out there actually has a big effect. And so the more that people are asking for renewables and for energy efficient measures for their buildings and so forth, the more likely that, that's, uh, that those things are going to happen. Great, thank you. I'm just going to put the slide back to that. Okay, so why cities? Why are we having this conversation about New York City or any city? And why do I care so much about cities that I'm devoting my entire job to it, as are these panelists and practitioners? So as you know, they consume, or maybe you don't know, they consume two-thirds of the world's energy. They're responsible for producing 70% of all greenhouse gas emissions. And by 2050, 70% of the world's population will be urban. So we've got to figure cities out soon because in 30 plus years, 70% of the world's population will be living in cities like this. So we got to figure it out. How do we do it? I'm most interested in what was set up at the very beginning by Kubi in terms of our objective tonight is how we increase and improve civic engagement and citizen engagement in this agenda. I just want to throw out one fact. Yale opinion mapping, opinion polls. I don't know if any one of you have ever used Yale's work, the Yale Project on Climate Change Communication. They have excellent data in terms of opinion polling, et cetera, around climate change. Majorities of the American public, majorities, good, strong majorities, are aware that climate change is happening, believe that climate change is happening, that it's anthropogenic, et cetera. Majority thinks we should cap CO2 as a pollutant. Majority think we should ramp up renewable energy. Minority, 10, 14% are doing anything about it. <coughs> Changing their consumption, reaching out to politicos or elected officials and telling them we need to ramp up renewable energy, we need to cap pollutants like CO2, or reaching out to the media, letters to the editor, columns, op-eds, et cetera. So majorities are in our camp. Attitudes are good. Climate change is happening, we should cap CO2, we should ramp up renewable energy. When it comes to behavior, we see minorities. It's not consistent, there's a gap. So I'm most interested in how do we close that gap and how do we help communities do what they want to do attitudinally because they're there with us. How do we improve those behavioral data points so that they are reaching out to their elected officials, 
they are changing their consumption habits, like Nilda was talking about in terms of consumer demand, and engaging in Solarize, like Trio was talking about, and they are reaching out to media outlets. This is an amazing time for subnationals. By subnationals, I mean cities, states, CEOs. We know that we're seeing incredible federal inaction and rollback. As a result, we're seeing cities stand up, we're seeing states stand up. You're familiar with the We Are Still In movement. We're seeing citizens stand up in a way they've never done before. So this is an incredible time for leadership. And New York City, the greatest city in the world, to my right, <laughs> is a leader and should be a leader on that front. So my question for the panelists is the following. When have you, in your community engagement, had a takeaway where you're like, ah, oh, that really worked? We reached out to the community, they responded, we created a very productive space, a, con a constructive space, and we saw an uptick in civic engagement, however you want to interpret that. Who wants to, I'd love to hear from all of you. Who wants to go first? Nilda. I'm jumping out of my seat here. Great. Because <laughs> so New York City has a mascot, Birdie. Uh, Birdie has a YouTube channel. Birdie has a Twitter feed. Um, there we go. Birdie Who's seen is, Birdie? We've all seen Birdie. OK. Birdie's like, right. <laughs> you know, you see him on subways, sometimes sides of buses. Um, so um, when I was with the mayor's office, we had a, um, a unit that really did public education and you know marketing, if you will. Um, a lot of the data was based on our own data that we generated, our own market studies. Um, some of it came from Columbia University, from the Center for Research on Environmental Decision Making. Some of the things that we found was that, and I do think that one of the issues in this space oftentimes is the way that things are communicated um, and the kind of interchange that happens with people who are outside of government. But um, the, so one of the things that we found was that people really respond to um, sort of the tribe and the, the sense of belonging. They don't really respond. This is like no surprise to anybody. They don't really respond to being shamed <laughs> into doing something. So um, all of our campaigns were along the lines of join the many New Yorkers who are, you know, recycling. Join the many New Yorkers or be one of the growing number who are blah, 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 blah. Can I ask and the audience a quick did, question? Can I do a quick poll? Uh, how... For those of you who have been shamed, have, has that worked for you in terms of motivating behavior? Or conversely, do you <laughs> find that the tribe, the collective, like we can do something works better? Is that a fair assessment for you too? Yes? Okay, yeah. cool. So, and one of the things that we did, you know, in our various campaigns, we usually run like maybe three or something a year. Um, we would target them towards, um, you know, particular boroughs. So we had, um, and, and, you know, where we thought they would have the most impact. So, for example, we had one on um, like heat conservation. And so, you know, turning down your thermostat. That campaign was really mostly focused on Staten Island and parts of Brooklyn and Queens where there are more single family homes and people actually have control over their thermostats, unlike many parts of Manhattan and Bronx and whatever, where you, it's just the radiator and you gotta open the window. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, so, so we did that. We, we also made these very interactive. So we would have Bertie, the mascot, in his large Bertie costume, going to many different community events, going to, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, food markets, you know, whatever it was, right? Going to schools, whatever it was. We always looked for very tall interns who could wear the costume. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyway, used Febreze, you know, anyway. Um, <laughs> so, and so one of the things that we did, though, was we had, we had people doing pledges. So, you know, one of the things we found was that um, the main reason people don't use reusable um, bags when they go to the grocery store is because they forget. You know, the main reason people don't use coffee mugs, they forget to bring them. So we had people signing a pledge and saying, okay, I pledge to remember to bring, you know, dot, dot, dot. And they could pick which thing they wanted to get. So we would send them a grocery bag, a reusable grocery bag. We would send them, a, you know, a reusable coffee mug. We would send them a water bottle just like this one, you know, so that they would actually do it. And there was something about that interactivity and, you know, there was a kind of element of game to it that also made things fun and made people know that they were contributing. Thank you, Nilda. Tria. Yeah, uh, what you just described for me, um, we call project-based change. So the idea is that you know most of us w can say we all want to be sustainable. We want to we want to you know live right and, and do it right, but we don't necessarily know what to do. 
And so if we can come up with processes or pledges or a program that we can participate in, like SolarEyes, it's much easier to participate in doing that sustainable action, whatever it might be. So we found that when we started looking at, again, you know, solar in the city, folks were sort of like big, tall buildings. I don't really see where the solar is. It just isn't really happening. And when the solar map got launched and people could see, well, actually solar is happening. It is up on rooftops and look, you know, my neighbor's doing it. And oh, you know, it's actually the payback isn't so bad at all. All of a sudden it became transparent and people started to, to join and the, and the growth has been exponential. It's, it's not where we, where we want it to be yet, but it's been exponential from if, a megawatt if, to over 100 megawatts. If any of these audience members want to support any SolarEyes campaign in their neighborhood, they would go to that site or would they go elsewhere? Yeah, you can go to the NY Solar Map. Um, the other thing I, I did want to add with Shared Solar, um, and you can get to everything through the NY Solar Map, but sharedsolarnyc.com.org, uh, both of them, um, you can go to that and if you want to be a subscriber, so if you go to the map and it turns out you can't um, put solar on your rooftop but you want to uh, list yourself as a, as a subscriber for one of the shared solar uh, projects, you can list as a subscriber and as we learn about new projects, we will email you and, and let you know about the opportunity. Thanks, Rita. Charles. Yeah, um, at the new school, in 2011, we entered a competition that the Department of Energy put on called the Solar Decathlon. And the idea was to build a passive solar house. Um, there were 80 or 90 different schools, teams of schools from around the world that participated. And we partnered with the Stevens Institute of Technology in New Jersey because they had an engineering school. The Parsons School of Design, which is part of the new school, and my school, the Milano School of International Affairs, Management, and Urban Policy, also part of the new school. So the Parsons students kind of worked on the design of this passive solar house. And the idea was, oh, let's just make this like beautiful and wonderful design concept, and it's going to be really interesting and, and, and really edgy. And fortunately, uh, Joel Towers, the dean of Parsons, uh, and some of my colleagues at Parsons said, yeah, but it's got to be practical, too. So um, does anybody know how to crunch any numbers here about how this is going to be practical? Uh, no, we don't crunch numbers. We're designers and architects and engineers. I mean, we got numbers, but we don't crunch dollars and cents. So they came um, to Milano and asked, uh, could we help? And I teach finance, so my eyes lit up, and I went to one of my classes and said, well, this is um, kind of a pop-up project. So uh, I think we should work with our colleagues over at Parsons on figuring out what the economics are, what the financial considerations are about making this passive solar house really affordable because it doesn't do any good if only millionaires can buy it, right? Or millionaires can subscribe to it or use it. And then we thought, hey, let's partner with Habitat for Humanity and create a house that can use the Habitat for Humanity model where people in the community can build. So this was about community-based change. So we created this house, made it affordable, um, we're partnering with Habitat, uh, got the numbers right, and he said, you know, we don't, this, we don't want this just to be a design that ends up in a warehouse at the end of the competition, you know, like, you know, like in the movies, where it goes to a warehouse, gets stamped, and it sort of stays somewhere. Um, so we said, let's actually move this house to a neighborhood in Northeast DC, a low-income neighborhood, and let's actually have families live in this house. So we built a house that a family um, actually moved into in the Deanwood section of Washington, D.C. Ha we built one house and kind of had all the plans and designs and the science and the different um, technologies. Habitat built the second house, um, and it really transformed. And, and a family, a, a single mother with three children, has, she was a State Department employee, um, moved into this house with her three kids. And the idea was everything was metered. If you used the television, you knew how much power you used. If you ran the washing machine, you knew how much power you used. If you only watched television for one hour as opposed to three hours, you could see how much power you saved. And at the end of the day, the goal here was to have um, the meter go backwards because this was going to be a net zero house. Uh, it was remarkable. Now, the change part comes we plopped this beautiful, interesting, sort of edgy looking house in an old neighborhood with lots of old housing. 
And neighbors started asking, you know, why do these windows look this way? Oh, well, because you need energy efficient windows, because you don't want to lose all your power through your heat. You don't want to, well, what, what, how do we do that? Oh, well, you know, Potomac Electric Power Company will pay you to install energy efficient windows in your house. What do you mean they'll pay us? No, they'll pay for the windows. And so, and someone, actually the, you know, the XYZ bank will loan you a little bit of money to so you have some skin in the game, and Pepco will pay you to put the windows in. So what ended up happening is other people in the neighborhood by observation, not by shaming, not by, just by sort of education at the community level, said, okay, energy efficient windows, now what? Uh, well, you could also do this with your water heater. You have a water heater? Yeah, we do. Well, do you have a this or that? Yeah, we do. Do you have the? Yeah, we do. Now, how do we change? And the whole neighborhood all of a sudden was knocking on our doors asking our students, of which a couple of hundred were involved over the course of two, three years, how do I improve my um, energy efficiency? Um, they didn't know what a passive solar house meant, and when you start talking about the technology for that, you know, people sort of went, yeah, yeah, yeah. But there were all these other things that you sort of could describe as low-hanging fruit that people could implement at the community level. And we thought that was really brilliant. Thank so. you, Charles. Fumi, do you? Sure. So um, our approach I, I sort of, you know, has an underlying idea that NYCHA is not going to be the coolest people in the room, right? <laughs> Um, we, our mission is to steward a portfolio of housing that was built between 1930 and, you know, mid-1930s and 1970-ish, right? I mean, it, it is not, you know, we're talking about real sort of bread and butter basic stuff when we're talking about the work that we do. So we are not the coolest people in the room. However, you know, with a population equivalent to the size of, you know, the number of people who live within the city of Atlanta, or as I learned recently, a couple weeks ago, the, you know, apparently as many people as there are in Stuttgart, Germany, very cool people, I'm sure. Um, you know, we ha there are lots of other folks among our residents and among the nonprofit organizations that work in low-income neighborhoods who do have really great ideas about things that, night that could be happening differently in NYCHA. And one of the you know, historic, uh, or one of the ideas about NYCHA has been that it is very difficult to figure out how do you get to do a project at NYCHA? Like who do you actually contact if you have a good idea that you wanna try out at NYCHA? So our approach is really to say, well there's gonna be a lot of stuff going on out there. there we already know that there are a lot of organizations and people who have um, ideas about projects that they wanna do around sustainability and we just need to be able to support them. And so part of the work that we are doing, um, you know, we have a, a, a non a affiliated nonprofit, the Fund for Public Housing. And the, but the Fund for Public Housing um, describes itself as sort of a, an innovation outlet for NYCHA, or inlet, really, for NYCHA. And so we, um, in, the, in the sustainability program, we worked with the P Fund for Public Housing to launch a thing called the Ideas Marketplace. It, you can think about it as sort of like a Kickstarter platform for projects that are looking to do sustainability work in, with NYCHA residents on NYCHA properties. Um, and it really sort of does two things. One is that it um, gives you a place to hang a shingle, right? So I have an idea about, you know, we want to do so, a, a resident engagement program around, um, you know, increasing, you know, recycling participation at my development in NYCHA. Well, and I have, a, I have a nonprofit organization that I'm partnering with, and now I'm just trying to figure out, well, who do I go to talk to in NYCHA? So you can come to the Ideas Marketplace. There's a place for you to sort of tell us in a structured fashion what your project is. It's, you have an, uh, an opportunity to do you know, crowd-based, you know, crowdsourcing, fundraising, um, getting volunteers, getting word out to other NYCHA communities about the work that you're doing. You have an opportunity to connect with other organizations and other resident groups at different developments. Maybe, you know, maybe you're in Brooklyn and you, wanna, you find out that there's, an there's a similar group of residents in an organization in Queens who are doing the similar kind of project. You can t go say, oh, like, let's share information. But you know, from NYCHA's perspective, it also gives us a structured way to provide support, whether it's in the form of matching grants that are administered by the Fund for Public Housing, or whether it's in the form of NYCHA's operations team saying, okay, well, you, this is, in order to do the project that you're talking about, this is the agreement that you have to fill out, this, these are the insurance requirements that we have, and we're gonna, we know how to you know, contact whoever is the lead of the project, and we will help you, you know, basically do the paperwork so that you can you know, implement the project that you wanna do on your, in your development. So if anyone here wants to support the good work you're doing, other than asking you after the panel, hey, how can we, can I get your card, et cetera? Yeah. 
does your site make that accessible? Yeah, so there's a, there's a sort of a landing page on the Fund for Public Housing's website that talks about the Ideas Marketplace. Um, our, implementa our technology implementation partner is IOB, IOB, IOBY.org, would say um, it's sort of a crowd fundraising website specifically for environmental projects. Um, and you can also go to the IOB website and find the NYCHA Ideas Marketplace there. Can you do the URL one more time? Sure, IOBY.org. Great. Yeah. So I have two questions for the audience, and then I just want to open it up because we have 20 minutes left. Two questions. One, what do you need to retrofit to the extent that you can? You may not be able to retrofit your own place, getting off some of the heating and hot water that Nilda was talking about in terms of the heavy carbon footprint that that comes with. For some, natural gas. For me, it was oil. What do you need to make that switch, if you can? And secondly, what do you need in terms of outreach to you so that you know what's happening on the city front when the city is greening the grid? So for example, did you hear about Mayor de Blasio's announcement of 1.5 degrees we're getting on the Paris plan and we're going to help the city and the world keep us from a warming below? He said 1.5 degrees. The Paris plan had us at 2 degrees, but we really need to be below 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels if we're going to survive. Who heard about that, for example? OK, good. So a lot of you are tracking the news. Who heard about his big target on big buildings and making sure they reduce their emissions over the next couple decades? Good. So folks are hearing about it. But I'm still interested, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, what do you need in terms of outreach from the city so that you're hearing what the city is doing? Go back to the first question, what do you need for a retrofit? Who was without power during Sandy? For how long? A couple days? A week? Yeah. So I just moved up to Vermont and just arrived, and I had a week without power because of a big storm that came through. I have an oil-burning furnace. You bet the next thing I did was bring solar over. We're going to have solar panels, heat pumps, a battery, because Tesla has this partnership with Vermont State. We can lease the battery. I don't have to buy the battery. So I made the switch quick because I saw more storms coming to Vermont, and I want to make sure I don't have uh, you know, no power for a week. So curious what you need for an incentive to help make that retrofit, because that's the big obstacle for the city. When I hear city staff talking about, like, how are we going to change? Am I right, Nilda? Yeah. In terms of the biggest emissions, they're in the buildings. How do we make those retrofits so that we switch over to electrifying everything, which is going to be a big ask, and some of you aren't able to tackle that because maybe you're a renter and it's up to the landlord, et cetera. And then the second question about outreach. So I want to open those up. You don't have to answer them, but let's go to audience question now. Feel free to answer them because I'm curious. Let's start in the back with a hand in the back corner. If you could just say your name and your question, please. Great. So question to you, where do you go when you're trying to, curious, where do you go when you're trying to figure out what can I do? Do, do you go to a particular site? I'm not always sure what site to go to. I don't go anywhere. Fair. That's a great question. Let's take two more before I get the panelists take up here. And then we'll take that one over there by the camera, please. Hi, Charlotte Benz. I'm curious um, if you guys know much about community choice aggregation, which allows municipalities to choose the default energy supply and negotiate amazing terms that save people money and uh, get to greener energy. And I'm curious if it's something that you're thinking about in your plans and integrating your work with that. Thank you for that question. CCA, Community Choice Aggregation. And then over by the camera, please. Great. Have 
And Nilda is not in. She's like, yes, 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 yes. yes. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Let's take one more, actually. Yes, please. that is to go even even further I, I live in a uh, co-op building that has extremely conservative management and the only way that you're gonna move anybody like that is to mandate it so I would say mandate mandates great so and community let, activism too yeah <laughs> thank you Jocelyn let's let's take a few responses and then we'll get another two or three or four questions so on mandates there is there is now legislation before City Council I highly encourage yeah, and I highly encourage you <laughs> to take a look. There are likely to be hearings in February or March of 2018, um, and anybody can go to those hearings. Sorry, 2018? So if we on, on, sorry, on the uh, new standards, the new proposed standards for building energy use intensity. Um, and I, I, anybody can testify at the hearings. Anybody can go to the hearings. So I would encourage, and this is this would be before the Environment Committee of City Council. So I would encourage you to look, and I would also encourage you to reach out to your council members to um, so that they understand how you know the level of interest there is in this, um, as well as to the mayor's office. Um, you're Sorry, can I, can I take you? one step further on that. So if they're going to call up their city council member, who's called their city council member ever before? Okay, good. So if they're going to call their city council member tomorrow, what should they say explicitly? It should be about the building energy uh, legislation that's been proposed by council member uh, Costa Constantinidis. And so, yeah, I don't have the, the number for it, but that's essentially, you know, what it is. But. 1745? Thank you. Great. <laughs> so I would, I would really track that because that's sort of like the most immediate thing that's coming up where people, I think, can have a way of, you know, sort of going in. Um, the other thing is that, so I live in a co-op building as well, which has also a conservative management company. However, the residents are not conservative. <laughs> and so we've all, and it's taken a while, but, you know, there's like this group of us that's been after the management company on this stuff, and you just have to keep at it sometimes with the management company that's... You know, that's all I can say. Can somebody ask about community choice aggregation? Community choice aggregation. Westchester, go Westchester, because they're doing a great job with that. Um, it came up while I was with the city, as far as the city, but it wasn't, it was like too early, so it's something to follow. What's the website for that? I forget. I don't, I don't know. I know there's sustainable Westchester. Power. Westchester Power, thank go. you. Dot org, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, I just, you know, want to make a point that on the energy efficiency front and even on the solar front, the, the financial, the numbers actually do speak for themselves sometimes. And if you're able to provide the numbers to decision makers, at the end of the day, it's the financial arguments that are gonna carry the investment. And so while we wait for mandates, bringing that information to decision makers, building owners, landlords, whomever it might be, is really important. Continuing to show that sort of, no, this is, this is unbiased data, this is a good investment. That's an important conversation to have over and over again. Do you, th do you think shaming works for landlords? No. No, I'm no, just wondering. It's, let's say. It's let's the say, data. You know, at the end okay. of the day, it's, it's a totally financial so it's it's, invitation. Is it a good investment? You know? So if, yeah. if they wanted to write a letter to the editor or an op ed for AM New York or Daily News, it would be all an invitation to landlords to get on board the economic This is a bandwagon. good right? Is yeah. it a good investment? It, it is a good investment. Yeah. Well, one thing we did, again, I hate to keep going back to the solar decathlon example, but we had um, our students go do a presentation to the New School's Board of Trustees, which had a bunch of real estate developers on our board. And this is a technical term. They crapped all over it because they kept asking questions about, this doesn't make any sense. This is too much money. It's go we're going to spend more money. We need to put this capital up front. How are we going to get a return on our investment? And our students didn't quite know how to answer that from the engineering design point of view, which has got the idea of, well, you need to go and appeal to people in suits with other people in suits that have numbers with them. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're wearing a suit or not, but if you bring the numbers in an Excel spreadsheet and you can do some sensitivity analysis about assuming this price and assuming that price and assuming how long does it take to get a return on investment, and people will listen, but they won't always, not everyone gets on board because of social justice or environmental justice or gender justice or political or economic justice. But most people that are in business do ultimately want to look at some data and some numbers. And if you can prove to them that at some level they can get a return, 
they'll look at it, right? And there are also tools, like the city has something called the Retrofit Accelerator, which tries to remove some of the obstacles for building owners and residents in order to do those kinds of calculations. So if you just Google Retrofit Accelerator, it'll come up, it's free. There are lists of um, contractors who buildings can go use who have already been like vetted with the city, um, but they will come in and they will do energy analyses of buildings, um, and that will make the uh, dollars and cents case to um, owners. Yeah, I pretty consistently encourage my cities to only advocate on the three following frames, economic health or security, and to stay away from all the other frames because economic health and security frames are so effective with their public. So if, if any of you don't have that data already, because the data are behind us on this, we have the economic data, we have the health data, and we have the security data, feel free to reach out to me later because I'm happy to get some of that to you. Let's take a few more questions because we're running out of time. Here, because you had your hand up way before, please. I have a question just financially related. Are there any enlightened sources of capital, banks, uh, state or city institutions that recognize the economic benefit of doing this, but will help hedge, you know, allow the financing to, to, to breach the time that's required to get the payback? Yeah, let's get a quick answer on that, because there were a couple sure. of yeses. Um, so um, there is a community development bank called CPC, um, and CPC for a number of years has been working on developing a, basically a green mortgage for multifamily buildings. And so the, for all of their preservation projects, they will actually go and look at the energy performance data they have standards that they, they want all of their um, loan applicants to meet, and so they and they also um, will underwrite um, the the savings that you would get by doing energy efficiency. So and that's a private, uh, you know, it, basically, it's a um, it's basically a pri How would they find it? Lender. What would they Google? CPC, it's a community. Uh, C, the, the URL is goofy though. It's a community. P dot com or something like that. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember sure. the or URL. Um, and then um, for commercial um, buildings, there is um, NYSEEC, the New York City Energy Efficiency Corporation, um, which again will underwrite savings and uh, as well as look at clean energy projects. Um, and then what a lender that we have worked with at NYCHA is um, the New York Green Bank, which is a, a division of NYSERDA. A lot of great resources. Hi, my name is Catherine Skopik, and as you probably know, Elon Musk delivered a 100 megawatt power pack to South Australia, the world's largest lithium ion battery storage unit. And <clears throat> this year, CUNY at the John Jay had not only their solar event, but it was solar and storage event. So, storage is seems to be a very important part of getting this. And you mentioned that you had. Elon Musk uh, battery storage to make your solar viable. I called him up personally. Right. <clears throat> so <laughs> good. So my question is, as the storage is moving along, and we're very close, we're very close to utility scale storage, as a matter of fact. So are we, is this going to help push the solar to the next step that we need in the city? And the second follow-up part to that is, is there any data that shows that if all the buildings in all five boroughs that were viable for solar had solar. How many megawatts would this be? Anyone want to take that question? <laughs> Tria? Um, uh, well, let me, let me start with the, the storage component of it. Um, you know, the, the, the fact is that, yeah, I think we're, we're very close to really seeing the market um, come, come to scale. Uh, there, there are definitely some, some uh, permitting and process uh, components that need to, to fall into place. And if you didn't see, the governor recently also, you know, signed a target uh, um, for the state. So now we're starting. Now we have a target here in the city. We have the state developing uh, a target uh, in 2018. We'll, we'll know more about that. Um, so we're, we're seeing that happen. Um, what I see as important for storage in, in terms of solar is that it will help make it resilient. It'll mean that we can use that solar power when we most need it. So Nilda talked earlier about um, the lines coming into the city br to bring that power into the city um, have, are, are sort of at capacity an awful lot. So if we can think about how to use that solar power that we're generating here when we need it the most, then we're really going to make the best use of that renewable energy. So I think that's a big, a big piece of it. Um, and you know, as far as you know, solar and where it can go and on, on rooftops, there's so many components to uh, really understanding where, um, where it's going to be able to work from the age of the roof to the roof's ability to, 
to you know be able to support solar. So it's 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 sort of hard to know exactly what that potential is. But the piece that is really exciting to me is that we're starting to also open up things like parking lots. I mean, we do have places where we can put solar that we haven't been yet that don't necessarily keep us from using that space for what we're using it for now. So thinking creatively about that is very important. And New York City has really stepped up with community shared solar in supporting the community shared solar NYC program and trying to think about how, how do we start opening up those rooftops that, um, that have not yet opened up. And NYCHA clearly being a, a leader in helping us to sort of see, you know, what are, what are the barriers we need to break down and what do we really need to understand is that a marketplace opens up, but we need to get all the uh, rooftop owners across the city thinking about how to open up their rooftops if possible. Before we close, panelists, were there any questions that you felt you didn't have an opportunity to address that you wanted to address? Or do you feel good with? I just have one comment. Um, so, you know, Nilda mentioned earlier about, you know, how, you know, in her building she has to open the window to, because she's overheated. I mean, obviously, I, I think everybody in this room knows that you know, overheating is a pervasive problem that we have in New York. And I think that, you know, one of the ways that, um, you know, at NYCHA we are, you know, we're working on this overheating problem. And one of the, the ways that you're going to be able to see whether we're successful or not is when you walk around the city, like, right, you go to Carver, two blocks over that way. If the windows are open, we are not doing well, <laughs> right? And I think that you know, we are going to be, you know, as we do our, the work that we're doing, we're going to be literally holding ourselves to the standard of like, are people having to open their windows because they're uncomfortable? I think that if, you're, if you live in a co-op building or you live in a rental building, you should hold your manager to the same standard. If you see, if your windows are open, if your neighbor's windows are open, it's not right. And it, you don't have to live with it. I mean, it's something that can be solved. And you know, we, we could talk about LEED and all kinds of other certification programs. But to, you know, because heat, and uh, in particular, makes up such a big percentage of how buildings use energy in New York City, the simplest way for you to know is that building working or not is like by looking at it and saying, "Oh, you know what? Your windows are open. You're not doing. You're doing something wrong, right?" So go and you know, be a be a a, a fly in the ointment with your management company about that, and and demand to be comfortable. I want to add one more thing before we close. Who's read Paul Hawken and Company's Drawdown? So Paul Hawken and company was a bunch of researchers on that project. Look it up, Paul Hawken Drawdown. Drawdown.org, drawdown I think, is the website. They looked at all the ways in which we can reduce global warming and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the top five were the following. Refrigerants, onshore wind, reducing food waste, transitioning to, sorry, we don't have time for any more questions. I see your hand keep coming. Transitioning to plant-rich diets, and then restoring our tropical forests, reforestation. Most of those have to do with food. So refrigerants, onshore wind, clearly doesn't, reducing food waste, transitioning to plant-rich diets, or ramping up plant-rich diets, and then reforestation of tropical forests. So I care a great deal about what we all can do outside of some of this grid talk that some of us may not be as involved in as these four panelists and experts are, so when it comes to sustainable food and sustainable fashion, all the things we can do to reduce our footprint, I hope that's a part of the conversation too, going forward. But I also hope to see a lot of you writing letters to the editor and reaching out to your city council members on 1745 and reaching out to your companies and your landlords to make the switch that we know we need to make. Help me thank this incredible panel for tonight. <laughs>